Hello again, guys. We're on to chapter 19. At lunchtime on Monday, George was sitting quietly in the school cafeteria, minding his own business. He could have got out his lunchbox and looked inside, wishing he could have bags of chips or chocolate bars or orange soda like the other kids, but instead he had spinach sandwich, a hard-boiled egg, yet more broccoli muffins and some apple juice pressed by his mother. He took a large bite of his sandwich and sighed. He wished his parents would understand that he wanted to save the planet as much as they did, but he wanted to do it in his own way, and this was all very well for his parents to lead their alternative lifestyles because they only hung around with their friends who were just like them. They didn't have to go to school every day with people like Ringo and his gang laughing at them because they wore funny clothes and ate different food and didn't know what happened yesterday on the television. He tried to explain this to his dad, but all he heard back was, we have to do our part, George, if we're going to save the earth. George knew this was true. He just thought that it was unfair and rather pointless that his part meant him being a laughingstock at school and not having a computer at home. He had tried to explain to his parents how useful a computer could be. But Dad, he had pointed out, there's stuff that you could help you do on the computer, stuff that would help you with your work. I mean, you could get loads of information on the Internet and organize your marches with email. I could set it all up for you and show you how. George had gazed hopefully at his dad, and he thought he saw a spark of interest, but it flickered and died. I don't want to talk about it anymore, his dad had said. We're not getting at the computer, and that is final. That, thought George, as he tried to swallow a lump of his sandwich of his spinach sandwich was why he liked Eric so much. Eric had listened to George's questions and given him honest replies, one that made sense to George. George wondered if he dared stop by and see Eric later that afternoon. There was so much he wanted to ask, and he also really wanted Eric to check on his talk for the competition. Just before lunch, he had finally summoned up the courage to sign up the board for the science competition, the one with the computer as a first prize. Under the topic, he had written, My Amazing Rock from Outer Space. It looked great as a title although George still wasn't sure his talk was any good. He'd taken his lucky rock from outer space and out of his pocket while he stood in front of the bulletin boards, but to his horror he had found it was crumpling into dust. It was the lucky charm, the piece of the solar system that he had picked up near Saturn. The principal had been delighted to see George writing his name on the board. He had bounced up as, up as George filled out the form. There you go, George, that's the spirit. We'll show him, won't we? He beamed at George. We can't let Manor Park walk away with every trophy. Manor Park was a private school that hogged all the prizes and won all the sports matches with boring regularity. Yes, sir, said George, trying to snuff his outer space rock back into his pocket, but the sharp-eyed principal spotted it. Oh, dear, a handful of dirt grabbing a nearby trash can. Toss it in here, George. We can't have you going to lunch with a pocket of dust. When George stood there, rooted in spot, the principal rattled his no the can impatiently under his nose. I was just the same as a boy, a claim George doubted. As far as he was concerned, the principal had never been a boy. He had been born wearing a suit and making enthusiastic comments about the under-12 football league. Pockets are full of nonsense. Drop it in and off you go. Reluctantly, George dropped the gray, crumbly remain of his most treasured possession into the can. He promised himself he would come back later and save it. As George munched his way through the sandwich, he thought about Eric and outer space and the competition day. While he was thinking, a day a hand crept over his shoulder and snatched a muffin out of his lunchbox. Yum, this looks good, said Ringo, his voice from behind George. George's famous muffins. Ringo took a large bite and then made a spluttering sound as he spat it out. George didn't need to look around to know that the whole dining room would be staring and laughing. Oh, that's gross, said Ringo, making a fake gagging sound. Ugh, Let's see if the rest is just as horrible. His hand made another dive for George's lunch, but George had enough. As Ringo's big paw rooted in the handmade wooden box, George slammed the lid down on his fingers. Ow, said Ringo. Ow, ow, ow. George opened the box again, allowing Ringo to pull out his hand. What is all this noise, said the teacher on the lunchroom duty, walking over. Can't you boys manage to do anything without causing trouble? Sir, Dr. Fruit Reaper, sir, screeched Ringo, who was cradling his hand. I was just asking George for what he had for lunch, and he attacked me, sir. You better give him double detention, sir, for the rest of the term. He's broken my hand, sir. Very well, Richard, he said. Go and see the school nurse, and I'll come to my room. When she's looking at your hand, I'll deal with George. He ordered him away at, at a point of his finger. George slouched away, smiling to himself. The rest of the dining room had fallen silent while they waited for Dr. Reaper to announce George's punishment. But Dr. Reaper surprised them, and instead of giving George an earful, he just sat down next to him on the long bench. Go on, he said, waved her hand at the rest of the room. Go on with your lunches. The bell will ring soon enough, you know. After a couple of seconds, the usual hubbub started up again, and after everyone lost interest in George and went back to their conversations. So, George, said Dr. Reaper. Yes, Dr. Reaper, said George. How are you? Dr. Reaper sounded as though he really wanted to know. Um, fine, said George, somewhat taken aback. 
how are things at home? They're, well, okay, said George, hoping Griefer was not going to ask him about Cosmos. And how about your neighbor, said Dr. Reaper, trying and failing to sound casual. Have you seen him lately? Is he around at the moment? Or perhaps he's gone away? George tried to figure out what the answer to Dr. Reaper wanted so he could give him the opposite. Perhaps people on the street are wondering where he's gone. Ugh, maybe it seems that he's just disappeared, vanished from view, no idea where he might be. Is it there? He peered at George, almost as though... Dr. Reaper sketched a shape in the air with his hands. It just flew off into outer space and never came back. Hmm, what about that, George? Is that what happened? Would you say? The George was gazing at George. The teacher was gazing at George, obviously wanting to hear that Eric had somehow melted into thin, thin air. Actually, said George, I saw him this morning. He hadn't, but it seemed very important to tell Dr. Reaper as he that he had. Oh, drat, muttered Dr. Reaper angrily, suddenly getting to his feet. Miserable boys. He walked off without even bothering to say hi. George closed up his lunchbox and decided to head back to the bulletin board so he could look for his rock in the trash can. As he hurried down the corridor, he passed Dr. Reaper's office and heard raised voices for a second and thought he listened through the door. I told you to deliver the note, said a familiar voice of Dr. Reaper. You did, said a boy's voice, which sounded like Ringo. You couldn't have, said Dr. Reaper. You just couldn't have. George would have stayed to listen longer, but then the bell rang and he desperately wanted to find his special outer space rock before class began. However, when he got back to the can, it had been emptied, and there was only thin plastic inside. Saturn, moon, and Mars were gone.